you for joining us this morning, and welcome to another edition of the Wealth Guardians Radio Show. We help folks retire the job, but not the paycheck. I'm your host, Doug Ray, and I appreciate you spending some of your Saturday morning with us. Bryce is here in the studio with me. Hey, Bryce, what's going on? I'm doing well, Doug. Looks like a nice day out there. Might be a good day to try to get in a round or two, huh? I'd love to do that. All right, I'll see you out there. Absolutely. And let's welcome Laura in today as well. Well, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, we're going to have a good show today. You know, for those of you who are new to the show, uh, Ray Financial and the Wealth Guardians is a local independent financial firm, and uh, we work with those within 10 years of retirement as well as those who are already retired. And most people don't know how to turn their retirement savings accounts into a steady flow of income once they're not drawing that paycheck anymore. And I focus my practice and continuing education on retirement income planning over the years. There's two powerful truths when it comes to your finances in retirement. Number one, what got you to retirement is not necessarily going to get you through retirement. And what I mean by that is this. Once you start taking money out of your retirement accounts, market losses hurt more than they did when you were putting money into your retirement accounts. And that brings me to point number two. Losses mean more than gains in retirement. Because when you were putting money in during your working years, you were doing this thing called dollar cost averaging. That's buying more and more shares as the market went down, and eventually that helped you out. Now, once you retire, it's just the opposite. You're having to sell more and more shares to create the same paycheck. And folks, what we do is we create personalized written retirement income plans for our clients, taking into consideration all the things that Doug was just talking about and a lot more so that our clients can live the retirement lifestyles that they've earned and saved for. And it's important to them what they've envisioned their whole lives. And most importantly of all, this is, I'll say this as, as often as I can, we practice as fiduciaries, which means we're required to make recommendations that are in your best interest, not ours. Well, before we get started with the show, like I always try to do, I want to salute all of our military, our veterans, our first responders. We thank you for your sacrifices and everything you've done for us. And I'll say that as well for the families. You guys are the backbones of our servicemen, so thank you for uh, what you do for our servicemen as well. So let's get started on our show. This week we're discussing one of the third rails of politics, Social Security. And, you know, no matter how much you've saved and invested It will always be the foundation of any retirement plan. And we, Doug and I, the Wealth Guardians, we work hard to help you get every dollar that you're entitled to. And uh, Laura, Doug and I decided to make you a guinea pig this week, so we're going (laughs) to throw a quiz at you to test your knowledge on the basics of Social Security. All right, I'm game. All right, you ready for this? Mm -hmm. All right, got a couple questions here. See if you're smarter than the average Joe out there. Probably not. Well, I know you've got decades to go (laughs) before this is relevant, but we'll see. All right, Lauren, how many years of employment are figured into your benefit calculation? I would say if you start working in your early 20s, 40? Yeah, you're very close. You're very close. Down that just a little bit. 35? There you go. Exactly. Mm, Good good job. That's not bad, Doug. Well, that's that's not based on radio salary. (laughs) (laughs) All right, question number two. What's the maximum income you can earn before they start deducting your Social Security between the ages of your full retirement age and age 66? I haven't the slightest clue. Nope. All right. Doug, you want to take a guess at that one? It starts at $38,000 of provisional income. Okay, very good. Question three. How does Social Security affect your Medicare premium amount? I imagine it's considered income, right? Part of it is. Okay. That's correct. The yep. rest of it is? <laughs> that, well, they, they, they consider a portion of it as okay. income so that it could affect your premiums by making it go up. Yes. And question number four, what's the difference between a spousal benefit and a survivor benefit? I don't know, but I'm sure I need to know. It's basically how well the marriage went. <laughs> <laughs> a spousal benefit means the marriage is still going on and you get a portion of what your spouse does if that's more than what your benefit would be. And a survivor benefit means that the relationship didn't go well at all, and you get the entire amount of what your late spouse would have gone, would have gotten. Well, these are all things that we need to know. Uh, and by the exactly way, right. there's a divorce spousal benefit, too. So, folks, listen, uh, you know, we're going to talk about all these answers, uh, but we're having a Social Security workshop coming up. It's March 12th and 14th at 6.30 p.m. 
look, there's no cost, there's no obligation for you to come, but you got to register. You need to call us at 336-391-3409 or just go online at thewealthguardians.com and register there. You know, Bryce and I, this is going to be a special event because Bryce and I are hosting, again, Hamilton Morales. I've had Hamilton in over the last two years, and he does a fantastic job. I often call him my walking, talking, breathing encyclopedia of Social Security. So we're going to be talking about Social Security in detail. Now, listen, if you've ever thought about coming to one of these events and you haven't done it, try this one. This is going to be a good one. And this year, we're only going to do two or three of these Social Security workshops. Right now, I think we're scheduled for two, this one and another one. So if you don't make this one, you got one more chance this year. We might throw a third one in there depending upon how, how well this one uh, is, is received. And right now, we're starting to fill up. Yeah, Doug. And, you know, most everyone knows that Social Security is a huge part of their retirement income. But I, I think it's safe to say that th- they might know a little bit about the, the the shell of it. But when they dig down into the nuts and bolts of the system, they don't realize all the details and the nuances there are in the different ways of filing perfectly legal strategies that can put more money in someone's pocket over a lifetime than if they just filed for the typical age 62 benefit like 70 percent of the population does. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Let's kind of talk about where Social Security revenue comes from in the first place. You know, you've got payroll taxes, obviously. Um, Federal tax is paid out on the actual Social Security benefits, and interest is generated on those Social Security reserve. So let's look at three details here. Payroll taxes help fund Social Security, and that's 12.4% of your earned income up to $128,400. So once you go over that threshold, there's no more Social Security tax taken out of your paycheck. Most workers only pay half of that, though, 6.2%, because the employer kicks in the other 6.2%. And if you're self-employed like I am, you pay the whole freight. So that's the maximum income number, and it changes almost on a yearly basis. And that's the primary way Social Security is funded, and it accounts for about 86% of the entire Social Security revenue bucket. Next, Social Security collects revenue from the taxation of actual benefits paid to the recipient. That's a sore topic for I most. I bet it is. Not everyone is taxed uh, because there is thresholds. And let's talk about the married couple who file a joint tax return. The first threshold is $38,000 of provisional income. So if you make over $38,000, then half of your Social Security is going to be taxed at whatever your tax rate is. Provisional income counts as everything on page one of the 1040 plus half of your Social Security income. Then the next threshold is $44,000. That means 85% of your Social Security is going to get taxed at uh, whatever your tax rate is. Now listen, you know, this is an interesting little tidbit. Laura, I'm going to ask you this question. Okay. You know, Social Security first came into existence back in the 30s. Franklin Roosevelt's uh, administration. And he said, by God, if I, as long as I'm alive, I'm never going to have Social Security taxed, right? Mm-hmm. What was the first president that taxed Social Security? Mm. It's in my lifetime. Yes, it is. All right. You're over 29. Just barely. <laughs> Come on. Uh, Ronald Reagan. You got that right. Wow, look at her. You got that right. He got something right. (laughs) He was the first president to tax Social Security, and that administration thought once they did that first threshold at $38,000, they thought they'd fix the system forever. But then the Clinton administration around 92 said, no, we need a little bit more. So they came up with that $44,000 threshold. Finally, the other income source is the $2.8 trillion dollars that comes from the interest from that $2.8 trillion. That's, uh, the, your payroll taxes go into this reserve fund. You know, Some like to call it a lockbox. It's not. All they do is buy government bonds with it, and that's what generates the revenue interest. In 2015, it generated about $93 billion. In 2020, that spare cash bucket is going to start to dwindle. And common thinking is, with no changes in the system, we're okay till around about 2034, which isn't too far away. So, 
we we need details about short and long term concerns people have been mentioning when they talk about Social Security. So in short term, we as I just said, we're fine. But you know, Social Security is a safe source of income. It, it's backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. It can function even when the government shuts down. In fact, Social Security recipients still got their benefit just recently when the government shut down. And it's going to require congressional changes to make a change. Long term, the changes in the demographics of the workers, for example, we have more people retiring, the baby boomers, that are in the workforce. So it's estimated that in 2020, the Social Security trustees are going to need to have to figure out a way to shore up the system. More revenue is going to be paid out than is coming in. And so changes are going to have to be made to keep it viable. What kind of changes are we looking at? Well, you know, there's a, there's a number of options uh, to out there. One of the ones that they're taking a look at, probably the most common option that they're looking at, is to increase the payroll taxes. And that, that can be done in two ways. It can raise the rate above that 6.2% 6. that Doug was talking about, or they can increase the ceiling amount of income. Now, currently, everyone's taxed. Uh, up to $128,400, and that goes to Social Security, so they might increase that above the 128400 Another option being considered out there is to cut benefits. Obviously, that would lessen pressure, but isn't a very popular solution. In fact, Gallup uh, did a poll back in 2015 and found that 51% would rather have the taxes increased versus 37% being okay with cutting benefits, and I think I'd fall into that category as well. And a third solution would be to actually raise the age that you can collect. Currently, you can collect at age 62, and a lot of people do this, even though your full retirement age benefit is somewhere around age 66. But there are serious considerations of raising that to 68, 69, or even 70 down the road. And one thing to, to keep in mind is that people are living a lot longer now. And 62 is really young compared to when the program was started and if you think back on this, a little history lesson for you, the government didn't think they'd be paying too many folks Social Security because they weren't supposed to die, or they were supposed to die, before they could collect a vast majority of them. So the lifespan of Americans has increased significantly, which is really draining the Social Security because they're, instead of paying the average recipient for a couple of years of benefits, they can end up paying them for 40 years of benefits uh, for some people. That is really taxing on it. We appreciate you listening. We're up against a break. You're listening to the Wealth Guardians radio show here on WPTI 94.5 FM, the Triad's news, talk, and sports station. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about Social Security and share a few real-life stories of folks we've helped with strategies to maximize their benefit over their lifetime. The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of the staff, management, or advertisers of 94.5 WPTI. Or of iHeartMedia. Welcome back to the Wealth Guardians Radio Show, where we help our clients retire the job and not the paycheck. And we'd like to show you how to do that as well. Doug, before the break, we talked about the Social Security system, where it gets the money to pay benefits, some of the challenges for the long term, as well as some solutions being considered to keep it rolling. If you're just joining us, I want to make sure that you know about our upcoming workshop. As Doug mentioned earlier, uh, we do several workshops a year. This year, we're cutting it down a little bit. So our first workshop is for 2019 is coming up March 12th and 14th at 6.30 p.m. in Clemens, North Carolina. There's no cost or obligation, but you do need to register. So you can give us a call at 336-391-3409 or online at thewealthguardians.com and go to our events tab. Hosting this time around is Hamilton Morales from the National Social Security Association and discussing Social Security in detail, and we'll offer all attendees the opportunity to come into the office for a free Social Security optimization report. If you can't make it, please do check out the Social Security white paper on our website under the Resources tab. So this is our first Social Security workshop of the year. You know, in years past, we've done a half a dozen or more during the year, but not this year. Uh, we've gotten really busy. Thank you, folks. I really appreciate the business very much. Uh, so we're going to cut it down a little bit. We are right now scheduled to only do two, and I might add a third one later in the year if uh, if we if we need to. So if you're within five years of retiring and you haven't yet filed for your benefits, you really need to come to this workshop. You know, we've talked about where the money comes from, but I'm interested in learning more about how the calculations are made when somebody does file for their benefit. Yeah, let's talk about those basic benefits. You know, it's kind of a 
bit of a complex formula. So they, you know, we talked about in the first segment, they take the first 35 highest earning years. They average that all together. They divide it by 12 to determine your averaged index monthly earnings, AIME for short. And that pit figure then is plugged into a formula to determine the starting benefit at your full retirement age, and it's called your primary insurance amount, or PIA. On statement, you're going to see three different amounts. If you look at your statement up in the big uh, number up in the top right-hand corner, that is your PIA. So they're going to show you also what you can get at age 62 and also what your benefit's going to be at age 70. And that is the benefit you'll get if you wait because you're going to pick up those delayed credits, which are about 7% per year plus any cost of living adjustment. So we discuss the advantages of waiting to get that benefit, the pros and the cons. And we also can talk about turning on income between 62 and 70. So when you file for your, your benefits really is dependent upon every single family, your needs, and what you're trying to accomplish, your goals, your retirement ages, and so forth. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things to consider. It's not just a one question and here's your answer type of situation. And this is part of what we do when we meet with folks. We When we run this report, we help them figure out the best time to file with the goal being, obviously, getting the most benefit of your lifetime. I mean, that's what most people want. I, I would say, Doug, until the other day, I would say that's what everyone wanted, but we didn't counter one person who did not want the most benefits that he could get, oddly enough, but that's a story for another time. But folks, you earned it. You're entitled to it. And we have seen examples uh, where married couples, the difference in the worst and best filing strategies means a difference of over $100,000 in their lifetime. And like I say, most people don't want to leave that on the table. And we should mention that there are often strategies for widows and divorcees as well. Um, I want to talk about, just for a moment, we recently had a widower uh, who came in to us and uh, was talking about retirement with us. And he did not realize that uh, after his wife had passed that he had some options on filing a survivor benefit. And unfortunately, that had uh, not realizing that had left some money on the table that he was not able to uh, get back. So um, while while his own benefits grew. So unfortunately, we had some had to break that news to him. But these strategies are perfectly legal. I'll also share with you a story um about a, a divorcee who had been laid off, and he was able to collect spousal benefits of 1400 per month, and she had no idea. So there's lots of uh, divorcees that don't know that this exists, and uh, we, we want to help you out there. We want to we help you figure this out so that you're not leaving that money on the table, folks. Um, I, I do want to mention that these strategies don't apply if you're already collecting. There's, there's very limited circumstances to do a quote-unquote do-over, and rarely do folks qualify for that. That's why it's important to get this right from the outset. Um, and, and no knocking on the folks at the Social Security offices, but uh, a lot of times they they don't have all of the information that I, ideally they should have. We we just got a letter from a uh, a client of ours this week, Doug, who we had told her exactly how to file or what to go into the offices to uh, what information to get from them. And uh, they gave her a whole bunch of wrong information. They were telling her, well, you make more than your ex-spouse did, so it's irrelevant what they made. And besides, we wouldn't be able to give you this information anyway until uh, your ex-spouse files for Social Security. And that whoever that uh, Social Security office worker was, was wrong on both of those accounts. So don't try to get your advice, folks, from somebody at the Social Security office. They're, they're not paid to give you advice. Uh, they're paid to uh, help you file, but not to give you advice on the best ways to file. And uh, that's where I'll lead into. Again, folks, we do have a, uh, a Social Security workshop coming up on March 12th and March 14th. You don't need to attend both. You could attend one or the other. 6.30 p.m., Hamilton Morales from the National Social Security Association will be speaking this time. Doug and I are both certified with NSSA as well, but uh, when we can, when we have the opportunity to get Hamilton come in, we jump at that opportunity. So register online with us at thewealthguardians.com. Go to the events tab, or if you prefer the old-fashioned way, pick up the receiver, 336-391-3409. So what I'm hearing, guys, is that there are a lot of factors that go into the best filing strategy, and it really pays off to work with somebody who has the experience and the software to identify the best strategy to pocket the most money. 
Yeah, Laura, you know, years ago when I first started doing Social Security optimization work, I um, licensed with a software manufacturer that actually took the Social Security manual and they coded the software line by line. And that Social Security manual is thicker than the Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments combined. (laughs) So we've never been proven wrong. You know, Bryce was talking a moment ago about how uh, sometimes some of our folks will go down to the Social Security office and try to file in a way that optimizes their benefits the way our software suggested, and they're told, well, you can't do that because of the changes a few years ago. Well, no, our software takes in that, that into account. And again, we've never been proven wrong. And in the case uh, recently, uh, we just had our clients go online and do it themselves without the Social Security office. So again, our focus is finding the most retirement income because it's what matters. And, you know, some folks, uh, it's not really a special strategy, but in some situations it really is. You know, another reason to run the report is the more you get from Social Security, the longer your other retirement accounts are going to last. It's really funny. I've done this so many times, thousands of times. When you do a Social Security optimization strategy, you're going to have to lean on your IRAs and your 401ks initially But it's amazing how when you optimize your benefits on Social Security, the longer those IRA assets are going to last. So we're going to provide you with a full retirement planning process, and it starts with that Social Security report. We're also going to identify strategies to minimize the taxes you're going to pay in retirement, which is obviously critical. And the less taxes you pay, the more that you put in your pocket. Uh, you know, Doug, going off of that same theme, one of the one of the cases that tends to stick out in my mind of people who didn't have all the information that they, they should have was a, a couple that we saw last year. Now, they weren't married, um, but they'd been together for a number of years, but they both had been married for over 10 years, uh, years before, and they were approaching 70, approaching retirement, and they were coming into us for a retirement plan, and we figured out that they had both been married, and they hadn't filed for Social Security yet. And we realized that they both could have filed off of their ex-spouses since they weren't married themselves and could have been receiving roughly around $1,000 a month for the last four years from age 66 to age 70 before they turned their own benefits on. And we did the calculations and that had come out close to $100,000 for them as a couple over the course of four years That is not news that I like giving to people. I don't know about you, Doug, but I like giving our clients good news. And uh, that was hard to tell them that um, they did. They took it okay, but you know that's. I would love to be only have to give people good news when they come in to see us and and say, hey, here's what you can do right now. Your timing is perfect. File this way, and you're all set. Here's the most benefits that you can get. Rather than telling them, boy, I, I wish you'd come to see us four years ago because your retirement picture would look a whole lot different right now. So that's just one case, but we have these, like I said, we just had this other case last week as well. So we have, tell us your favorite case, Doug. Oh, gosh, I guess it was when I first started doing these Social Security workshops. It was one of the first workshops I did. Uh, This lady came in. uh, She was divorced. Again, another divorce spousal benefit situation. This was back in the teeth of the recession, and she had just been laid off. And she didn't realize she qualified for that divorce spousal benefit. And uh, we did the work and found out she was entitled to about $1,100 a month. And, you know, that really helped her at that at that point in time. And, you know, it, almost every workshop we uncover a case or two just like this. We do. Or, yep. or in some cases, you know, we help people find an extra $100,000, $150,000 in benefits over their lifetime. And that's really rewarding on, on our part to help you folks find these benefits. And, you know, this workshop we got coming up on uh, on Tuesday and Thursday Again, I, I got to tell you, we got Hamilton, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, coming in to help us out, and he has been well received. He is a national uh, spokesperson on on Social Security. He gives these talks all over the country for for financial advisors, and you know, 